Well hello everybody. Well I'm back again today and I'm sorry to say everything yesterday went a bit peak tongue didn't it? I just spent about half an hour waffling on about why you might use a logic analyzer but I didn't really explain what it was for and uh, I don't think, well we didn't even get to have a look at the logic analyzer did we? So this is it that we're going to be playing with today. It's a DLG 7050 logic analyzer and it's made by Kirkusui. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to think some of my videos are starting to feel like those ice road truckers where people just have one moment of disaster and then they just keep showing it the same moment again and again for like 30 minutes where nothing actually happens. Well, that's what happened last time. So, yet again, I'm going to do a recap of a recap. So, why do you want a logic analyzer? Well, the reason you want a logic analyzer because pieces of equipment like a traditional oscilloscope they don't have enough inputs to monitor uh, a number of digital lines so your old oscilloscopes would maybe have a couple of channels uh, maybe a good a good modern scope will maybe have between four and six channels but if we actually look at this lcd display here it actually has six well sorry we'll start again it actually has eight data lines and then it has three control lines and what you wouldn't be able to do is you wouldn't be able to um, capture the information on all these different wires at once even if you had the digital scope you wouldn't even you wouldn't be able to do that so one of the advantages of a logic uh, a logic analyzer is that it's actually got a lot of input channels it's not just got two or four or six it's uh, it's typically got more than that this Kirkusui unit that we've got has, um, has got uh, 16 input channels on it as set up as standard, but it wouldn't be common to have, uh, you know, uh, 32, 64 or 128 for bigger systems. But I think, I suspect this Kirkusui unit when it was built is relatively a low cost one as these things go. And uh, it's just got the 16 channels and probably 16 channels was considered fairly adequate um, when this device came out. I'm not sure how old it is. I suspect it came out sometimes in the 80s, so maybe I'll need to have a look at the manual for that. So the way that the LCD works, recapping a recap, is that there's a, a PIC microcontroller on the back of here. Well, actually, there's two microcontrollers. There's a PIC here, and there's a, a, some derivative of the 8051 here. Uh, whichever one it is, one of these microprocessors sends uh, information to the LCD and it sends it via all these digital control lines. So this box here represents our microprocessor and this box here represents the LCD display and you can see that the, the, the PIC micro in this case is connected to the LCD and what I'm trying to show is this PIC microcontroller is trying to send the word phishing to the LCD so what you'll have is the uh, the PIC microcontroller will send, um, it's already sent the words F, sorry, the letters FIS. So it sent FIS. The next letter it's going to send is the H. And then you can say back in memory, we've got I, N and the G. So th that's what we're trying to do. We're going to tr pretend we're sending the word phishing to the LC display. So why would you use your logic analyzer? Well, if you were having problems trying to get this LCD to work, uh, maybe you were sending the wrong data and you you weren't saying you weren't sending the word phishing maybe you uh, maybe you'd sent a, a t instead of the h and that would be a totally different word um, and you you wouldn't necessarily know what was going on now there'd be no use trying to use your voltmeter or your logic pro because you know the number of different data lines that are going to be the data on them is going to be constantly changing and you couldn't do it. So what you actually need is a device that can actually capture the data on all these different lines. And uh, the way that we do that is we use something called a logic analyzer. So what the logic analyzer has, it has what they call, let's well, call it a pod. And the pod has a lot of little cables coming out of it. And you can connect all of those individual cables to the data lines that you want to monitor. And you also need a ground reference. And then you'll tend to have a cable coming out of the pod and that goes back to the logic analyzer device. So as this thing is pumping data through, what the logic analyzer will do, it'll be capturing it in memory. And there's various ways that you can do this capturing. You can either let 
the logic analyzer just run on its own, which is called timing mode analysis, which basically just means every whatever you set the clock to internally in the logic analyzer, it will maybe sample every 20 microseconds. It'll, it'll have a sniff what's on the bus and it'll write it to memory. Then it'll do nothing for 20 milliseconds. Then it'll read the data bus again. And again, it'll write it to the memory and so on and so on. So you could see here that basically although the microprocessors in the in the process of actually of sending the H, the I and the G, what you could actually do is you could set the logic analyzer up to sit there and capture in the background and it would build up this complete word phishing in its memory. And what you would do is if for example uh, one of these letters came out uh, maybe it put uh, I don't know, a V, F, V, S, H, I, N, G. What you would actually do is you could actually have a look at these, the individual bits that had been transmitted through to the LC display and you'd go, oh, well, that's not right, isn't it, is it? So that would maybe make you think there was a problem with your uh, your microcontroller, maybe your, your program in here, which is generating the characters, there's something wrong with it. Or maybe there's even something wrong with your data bus. So... Yeah, again, so one, one way we can set up the logic analyzer to work is, is what they call timing mode, uh, where basically it's just a, a free running clock which uh, periodically samples data and records it into the memory. The other way of using a logic analyzer is something that they call state analysis. Now in state analysis mode, what you use is an external clock. So rather than just filling up the memory contents every 20 microseconds or so, what you can do instead is you can take a clock line from your circuit under test and you can put it into your logic analyzer and then it will only do a read, it'll only trigger if you like when it sees a piece of valid data. Now what I suspect we should use if we want to use this um, state analysis uh, method is to um, use the strobe line. So the way that again the LCD works, you put you put data onto the onto the control bus here, you present it to the LCD, LCD display, but the LCD won't actually read the data in until you put you send an enable pulse, which they call a strobe line. So I think the way that you would probably use this strobe line if you were using a logic analyzer you would actually set the strobe line to be your um, your input so that it only actually triggers and records a piece of information when it sees the strobe line. So, yeah, so we're going to maybe have a look at that as well. Uh, notice that they call these things uh, logic analyzers. For example, they don't call it a logic scope. And the reason, they do, I guess, they don't call it a logic scope is because... Uh, a logic analyzer has got a lot of specialist functions for you can view the data it records in various formats and because you record such a lot of data uh, you need to be able to do searches on it because maybe your problem only occurs whenever you get this pattern whenever you send in the letter F or the le next letter after the F. So what you need to be able to is you need to be able to search through all the data that you've stored in the memory. This could be hundreds or thousands of pieces of data. You need to search for them to get to the meat and drink of it. So a logic analyzer, the, the analyzer term is very important because one of the main functions within a logic analyzer is all these tools it gives you to search through the data it's recorded and look for problems. Right, let's look at the logic analyzer. I think I said earlier that I bought this uh, a few months ago and I didn't pay paid hardly any money for it. It was £20, that's why I bought it. It was so cheap I couldn't refuse it because back in the day these things cost thousands of pounds. So let's have a look what it's come with. I have had a look in here before but um, I've never even switched this on before. No, that's a lie. I switched it on the day I bought it, had a quick look and switched it off again. Um, didn't have time to play with it and still haven't. So let's have a quick look. Okay, this is what I was talking about earlier when I talked about that they come with pods. This is used, this piece of equipment here, one end of it plugs into the logic analyzer and it actually says probe A on it there. So I'm guessing that plugs into there. One side of this plugs into the logic analyzer and the other side has some flying leads coming out of it which are going to plug into the circuit under test. So let's take that one out. Ah. 
Ah, oh, right, okay. So we've got another one, which I think is the same as the first one we took out. Um, yep, it says it's uh, a Logic Pro PR1 DLG. Well, actually, both these look as though they're exactly the same. They both say Pro Bay on them. Um, I'm not sure about that then. That says Probe A, that shows Probe B, that one says Probe C. But this one though has got the uh, the grabber probes on it. So these are the probes that will attach to the circuit that we're going to be testing. And uh, let's have a look at them because the grabber probes when it comes to um, logic analyzers are really important. And in fact when I've looked at these things on eBay before before you go out and buy a, a logic analyzer, if you fancy having a play with them, because you can get them for bargains now because they're pretty obsolete, really. Um, make sure that you get the uh, these pods with it. And you also want to make sure you've got all the leads and the probes because these things, to actually buy them on their own, if you try and buy them in bits and pieces on eBay, are really expensive. And these, these grabber probes, to get ones that are decent quality, are really expensive. So let me just see if I can bring you in so, you, so I can show you what's on one of these grabber probes. So if you look at the pod itself, you can see that one end, there's just a lot of wires coming out of it. And it's giving us an idea what the wires do here. So I can see it's got written on here. It's got channel zero, ground, channel one, ground, channel two, ground, channel three, ground, all the way up to uh, channel seven with a ground. Um, Okay, they just obviously plug into there, and all right, this has just got one ground connection plugged in. I'm guessing that's all you need if all the connections are on the same, roughly the same place. But I can actually see this uh, ground connection where it plugs in. It's actually a bigger connection than the actual channel input, and I'm guessing that's so you don't ac accidentally plug a signal wire into. Uh, into a grounded terminal strip because that could uh, that could ruin your day, couldn't it? So these grabber probes, I've just got one in my hand there, and if I just press the end of it, can you see the little fingers that come out? Hopefully that's focusing. Really, are little 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 uh, very delicate little grabbers come out of the tip of the probe, and the idea of those is uh, back in the day. Um, where you're using, you know, big dueling line logic chips and things like that. You can actually clip these little wires around the legs on the IC. Um, or more, perhaps more commonly, you'd have some dedicated test points you could clip onto for debugging purposes. But they really are quite small and delicate. Well, I say they're small. They're not particularly small compared with a modern surface mount chip. Let's just have a look at this other board here. So I say how small these are, but... You know, you're not going to, uh, well, let's have a look at one of them there. You're not going to get these grabber probes onto, for example, one of these little chips here. The, the probe is pretty much bigger than the IC is. So, yeah, that's no good. But what we will do is when we connect this up in circuit, we will basically connect these onto the wires that we're interested in, onto various bits of the data bus. And that will take the information into the logic analyzer. Now, oops. Now these pods are actually very important. Hopefully you can see there's quite a long lead on here. So what's actually inside the pod? I think it's typically some form of uh, field effect transistor amplifier. These, these, this wiring has to be high impedance. And if you were driving long wires like all this cable, if you were actually d directly connecting one of these wires, all the way back through this long cabling to the actual logic analyzer what would happen is that it would slow down the edges of the uh, of the digital circuit of the rising and falling edges of the of the data lines you were trying to uh, test and it would actually just completely uh, ruin your measurement uh, and of course the higher the speed the data bus was running out the worse it would be so these have to be high impedance and the way that they accomplish that it's some form of buffer amplifier so this will be buffering the signals and as I say these grabber probes are really important you know you want to keep the wires as short as possible because not only do they load the circuit they also introduce any any noise back into your circuit under test as well so yeah 
the problem with logic analyzers is they're really complicated pieces of equipment they, they are quite hard to use they're very fiddly to use and if you're not very 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 careful the uh, the information they give you is garbage uh, it can be really misleading so okay so that's what a pod looks like what else have we got in here well it's like we've got another pod This looks similar to the others, but it's got some different text on the top of it there. Don't know if you'll be able to see that, if that'll focus in. So it's got ECK, CQ, uh, Q1, Q0, G serial, sorry, ground and serial. So again, I'm, I'm going to make a guess here that this pod is designed for serial interfacing, because that's another important thing that a logic analyzer would have been used for back in the day. If you were trying to look at any form of serial comms and record it, um, you would you would use a logic analyzer to do that. Um, of course, modern scopes have protocol decoding, but you know, back in the day, cathode ray tubes didn't, you know, the old scopes. So again, that's why we used logic analyzers to be able to do that that data decoding analysis because back in the day as normal scopes couldn't do it um, right yeah so this this pod here this is slightly different this this has got the number pro3 whereas the others say pro1 so i'm guessing that this is probably designed specially for um for doing serial analysis um, it's got ek on it i'm guessing that's external clock uh, CQ, don't know what the CQ setting is, Q1 and Q0, what they'll be is they're what they call external qualifiers and my understanding is that you use them as kind of a trigger word if you want to trigger in a particular piece of data or only take a reading at certain times you can set up these Q0 and Q1 perhaps just to make uh, the logic analyzer trigger it's a bit like uh, an external trigger on the oscilloscope I believe anything else in there uh, got a spare grab a probe there and I grabbed it a moment ago a manual has it got a date on it can't see anything it's got an original uh, label on it here certified and inspected by somebody in Japan lots of lovely Japanese writing there Okay, better just put the uh, put this in the uh, the manual storage drawer. So I'm guessing the first thing uh, to do is uh, is to plug all these various probes in. Right, so this one does say probe C on it, so let's stick it in there. Well, that feels a little bit loosey goosey. I think we'll just tighten that up a bit. Just don't want to damage the connector by, uh, well, you know, by wobbling it around. These are just looking at these. Uh, these look a lot like the types of connectors you used to have on uh, parallel printer ports on computers. Um, I don't think it's as big as that. I think they used to call them Centronics connectors, didn't they? I'm not sure what you actually, if that was a name for the, just a printer port or if that's actually what the connector is, a Centronics connector. Yeah, I'm not sure about that, but that's what it looks like. It looks like a slightly smaller version of a parallel printer connector. Again, back in the old days, all the young players won't know what that is, will they? dot matrix printers I can remember back in the day printing out rude pictures on a dot matrix display and uh, kind of the the pictures were all kind of printed using letters you know A's and B's and you just basically got a silhouette and uh, yeah that kind of counted as a uh, computer porn young people today you don't know what you're born you really don't uh, all right, okay, both these say probe A on them, so um, yeah, don't know why, but let's try that. Yeah, all right, well, let's try it.
I think we'll just give it a bit of a wipe before we switch it on because it all looks like it's covered in jizz or something, I don't know. I'm actually quite excited to be trying this. Um, I seem to remember again, back in the day, logic analyzers, um, you would never, uh, you wouldn't own one yourself as any kind of an amateur. These things just cost such a lot of money and they were so specialist. Um, Today, this type of bench stop equipment, I think it's pretty much obsolete unless you're doing something very high end and very high speed. Uh, they've been pretty much replaced by little USB type test instruments and uh, I've actually got one of these USB style logic analyzers and I have used it a few times and uh, yeah, it's been, it's been relatively useful. Um, I did use one to find a problem where we had a microprocessor that was just crashing and uh, yeah, I think it was actually a bug within the microprocessor firmware that the manufacturer had provided but for some reason whenever it was doing a read from the MUX bus if the external data on the MUX bus changed for whatever reason it would cause the, uh, the microprocessor to crash um, so yeah I have used one once before and that was one of these USB ones and uh, it's the sort of thing when you need it, you really need it, nothing else will quite do but oh, they, they, they are painful to operate right okay we've, we've cleaned it a bit let's uh, well let's switch it off mm. that's not right No, that's not right. Ah, right, uh, that's it. Got it set to 1970. Click that over. So we will switch on. Is anything about to short out? I don't think so. Well, that all looks quite complicated. Let's see if we can bring you in and you can see what I can see. Can you see that all right? Okay, we've switched on and we've got a lovely little green power light here. Maybe not very exciting, but the, um, you know, the actual power lamp here, the green lamp, it's got a little glass bezel on it, which is, you know, cut a bit like facets of a diamond. So they haven't just stuck an LED through the front panel. We've actually bothered to put a little bit of a lens in front of it, and that's just really, really pretty. I like that. Uh, right, okay, we've got some, what do you call them, soft keys? We've obviously got some keys here that work on the, uh, that work on these various soft menus at the bottom. I really am looking at this at the, the first time. I haven't, I haven't played with this one, apart from just switching it on to make sure it didn't explode. So let's look at this line one, sampling clock. Okay, so I'm guessing this is set to read data in. It says it's set to 20, 20 nanoseconds. Um, got some cursor keys here. What happens when we... Uh, ooh. Oh, I don't ever wanted to do that. How do we get it back to go to the menu? Menu button. Okay, right. So now we've gone on to the sampling clock menu. And it looks like we've got the opportunity to change it into nanoseconds, microseconds, milliseconds. And I think it's also showing external plus and external minus. Now I'm guessing that's external triggering. 
whether or not the plus or could the plus or minus be falling or rising edges yeah not, not sure um, I'm going to post this video up shortly so people who actually know how to work one of these it'd be really helpful if you could post some comments and give me a bit of advice because I don't know how far we'll get today with this because these they are just tremendously complicated instruments so yeah so it looks like this first line here is setting a sampling clock uh, of, of how frequently it's going to read in data from the uh, from the pods that are connected to our circuit um, 20 nanoseconds sounds probably a bit fast for what we want but yeah we'll maybe look at that later trigger I think what the trigger does is it allows you to actually only start recording data when you see a certain sequence of bits on the uh, you know on the input probes on the input channels so I'm guessing you can you can set these um, to actually start it right into memory start start the to start the logic analyzer grabbing samples of data and writing them to its memory I'm guessing that's what that does um, and you've also got these Q two Q inputs which we saw earlier which are qualifiers yeah I think again I think qualifiers are something to do with only reading certain data at certain times I'm not exactly sure it looks as though there's something called a filter I don't know what that does polarity of trigger word that's set to leading yeah again not sure uh, event delay all right okay it looks like you can set up delay and it's minus 500 now I'm guessing here that this minus 500 maybe means that uh, it's got some what do you call it pre-triggering on an oscilloscope or I think you call it post trigger wouldn't you uh, basically it will it will capture the information 500 samples before it actually sees a trigger so you might set this uh, trigger word here to be a piece of corrupt data that you're looking for you know when something goes wrong in your microprocessor system but you don't want to see it the second it goes wrong you want to actually look at what happened before it all went wrong so I think you probably set up this uh, this delayed triggering to do something like that because at the moment it's set to minus 500 which I'm guessing is a post trigger I am making this up by the way I'm, I really aren't sure then we've got something called input mode yes yeah, sorry I don't know what input mode does threshold right I do know what threshold is basically depending on what what um, logic family you're working with um, you would set this threshold voltage to be correct for the logic family now this is set to 1.4 volts which I'm guessing is approximately right for um, TTL logic but you could also um, you know set this to a, a lower voltage if you were using 3 volt free or again back in the day if you were using CMOS logic didn't that run up to 14 volts or something I'm guessing you'd have a high threshold voltage uh, repeat control no idea compare no idea search for words yeah got no idea no idea don't know any of that works uh, let's see what else we can press got some buttons over here menu Mm, yeah don't know what that does parallel parallel serial GIP monitor uh, we're not interested in GIP serial I'm guessing is for looking at serial waveforms we're going to be looking at parallel so I'm guessing that this is actually showing various bits that could be on our inputs at the moment it's funny that it's put data appears to have put data in these memory locations even though we haven't actually uh, done a trigger zero one all right okay maybe that's just some kind of automatic test function it's done there because I can just see that looks like a counter so maybe when you switch uh, switch the logic analyzer on it just fills the the memory with uh, just kind of random data or some kind of self check so what each one of these represents here these are our input channels here so you've got uh, input 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 so that will be on this first probe A and then you've got 8 9 A B C D E and F that will be on this second probe input there uh, 
So, uh, and what it, what each line represents is a um, function of time. So I'm guessing that like that time zero, that would be the first sample. And then depending on what the sampling clock is, I think it was set to 20 microseconds, wasn't it? So number one would be 20 microseconds later. So number two would be another 20 microseconds later. Number three would be 20 microseconds later and so on. So these are going to be filled up when you actually set this uh, logic analyst to start sampling data from the data buzz, it's going to fill up this memory and it's going to read in a sample of data uh, depending on what you've got the uh, sample clock set to which is 20 nanoseconds. Uh, what else can we do? Alright, okay. So it looks like we can display this in two formats. So it, it's telling us that that's a, a state drawing so that's showing the individual bits there, uh, but we can also we press the timing button there. We can also show that, show that as a function of time. So that's really looking like a, an oscilloscope. Do you remember when we had the oscilloscope on the other day and we saw the, um, you know, the various bits of waveform information? So you can see that there. And because, let's just go back to that state. Because these bits were binary counters, there you can see that bit zero was transitioning very quickly because it was a binary count. Two was a bit slower, three was a bit slower still, so let's go back to the timing. So you can see bit zero is transitioning really quickly, bit one slower, two is slower, three. Because effectively it's it's kind of a binary divide, isn't it? Uh, Alright, okay, so that's interesting. Uh, what other buttons have we got on here? We have got something, we've got a clock speed, look what happens when we press that. Alright, okay, I can see the clock. So that's going to be changing our sampling clock. We've got a button we can press, start, single, so I'm guessing that's going to, let's press it, single. Alright, okay, so pressing that obviously reads data into the logic analyzer and we can stop it. OK, but we're not reading any data in because we haven't connected it up yet. We haven't connected the grabber probes up to our circuit under test. Let's do that and see what happens when we press some more buttons. Mm -hmm.